What's up guys, it's Nurse Howie. Is your patient getting really tired? Is your blood pressure going over 40, over 10, or something that low? Is your patient having a hard time staying awake? And are you really, really worried about him or her? Well, let's talk about cardiogenic shock. If your patient is feeling these symptoms, you will wanna know and find out how to assess a patient who is in cardiogenic shock, and most importantly, what to do about it. Stay tuned, pow! All right, I know most of you have worked in critical care or at least tele, and these are all very important places. And any of these units, a patient can fall under cardiogenic shock. But it's really hard to realize when you don't realize, because vital signs are always very kind of particular, right? You always say vital signs, you see them every day, you see them every hour, and it's kind of like blah, you know? But you want to see your patient's trends. Now, if you have time, and uh, you got a good report from your previous nurse and you wanna assess your patient, you kinda wanna see how the patient is looking first. So, of course, after you give report, you do your patient assessment. And sometimes you wanna take a look also at the monitor, but of course we know that the majority of the importance comes from assessing your patient first. So when you come in, say, hi, my name is Howie, I'm your nurse for today, this is the plan, I'm going to assess you now, and then we'll figure out what to do tonight or today. So I talk to the patient, and when I'm saying hi to myself and I'm introducing myself, I'm also checking the neurological status. Is the patient talking to me? Is the patient making good eye contact? Is the patient saying the right things in the most appropriate words or whatever? Sorry, Remy, he's kind of bored. Anyway, so if the patient is really, really tired, super duper drowsy, doesn't want to eat, you know, something's wrong. Um, of course, we need to be able to back off of our um, you know, biases, especially if a patient is, let's say, not a very fun patient, patient is always in a cranky mood, you know, and the patient always feels like nothing you do is right. After a couple of days, you're gonna kinda wanna forget about this patient and just kinda go through the emotions. But you need to check yourself once you walk through the door and just be like, hey, this is a new day. Something might be wrong with this patient. I need to check what's wrong. So you just kind of try to bring down your ego, which I sometimes have trouble with. I mean, come on. <laughs> no, but um, just kind of bring yourself back to baseline and then reassess the patient as if they were in front of you. They were never in front of you before. So I had a patient who had been my patient for a few days and this patient had congestive heart failure. So already cardiogenic shock was in my radar, but not close enough to where I would worry about it because this patient um, was actually in step down at the time. And so I followed him down there and I started taking care of him. So he was out of that ICU um, situation um, because there wasn't as many uh, patients down there and there were more ICU nurses. So I decided to just kind of keep him and take him down a step down and work with him. Um, he was not a very fun patient. Nothing I ever did was actually very um, good. You know, he was never happy with any of, of the, me or any of the other nurses, but I was basically stuck with him and he was stuck with me. So when I came into the room, he was just very tired and he's like, nurse, I, I don't want to eat. I'm very tired. You know, I slept all night and I'm just even more, did you give me something? And I said, no, I don't remember giving you anything because I just came into the shift. And I don't remember the previous nurse actually giving the patient any PRN medications that would sedate or hypnotize him. So I also checked that. And um, once I was checking the patient, I do a head to toe assessment. So we've done, so a soft blood pressure is when the systolic is below 100 millimeter mercury. And a soft blood pressure, as long as the map is above 60, 65, you're pretty much okay. However, I like to cycle my patients who are unstable hemodynamically to at least every 15 minutes. And when I rechecked the patient, I came back after a few minutes and saw that I couldn't get a temperature. And then when I checked the blood pressure, the blood pressure was still soft. I checked it again. And then I changed it to the other arm and I checked it again. So, at this point, red flags start popping up, right? Your nursing instincts starts coming into play. The patient can't give me a temperature. I tried multiple times in the mouth. I even tried the axilla, and that was even worse. It didn't give me any sense of a temperature at all. And even if it was, it was very low. So that's your one clue. 
You're actually second clue. That's actually your second clue. Your first clue is the patient's tired all the time, very fatigued. But that's almost normal with cardiogenic heart failure, I, with cardiac heart failure patients. But there's more that keep adding up. So the temperature is, is you're not getting a temperature. And then the patient is just, um, the blood pressure is just going down, down, down. And then if you try to switch different arms, try different blood pressures, you've done repeated blood pressures, the blood pressure map keeps going down, down, down. So again, the first symptom is a patient's very tired. A second uh, symptom is a patient can't give you a temperature. And the third symptom is that the blood pressure keeps getting soft and soft. You can go further deeper into it by realizing that the patient is weak. The patient can't even talk to you, um, almost, but even though they're still with you. Uh, you can also see that you, here's one thing also that you can't um, take this for granted. You touch the patient's limbs. You don't know how many things I've caught when I found that the patient is very cold. You know, you kind of talk about this in conversation, in general conversation in the parties and be like, oh yeah, your hands are so cold, cold hands, warm heart, blah, blah, blah. But if you have a cardio patient, cool limbs is a sign. Cool limbs is one of the first things that show up where the body is actually trying to preserve the ejection fraction and preserve the, the heart to be able to have uh, enough perfusion into the brain. So the limbs will go first. So basically, uh, the more distal arterials and veins uh, start to constrict um, in an effort to save most of the blood uh, closer to the center of the body, to the core, to the heart, and especially up the carotid artery so that it can supply the brain with perfusion. And perfusion gives blood and blood has nutrients, including oxygen. So your, your patient's life is trying to preserve itself by doing these basic, basic things you don't necessarily see because there's no machine attached to it. But you just use your nursing assessment to realize that one, two, three, hey, something's wrong with this patient. So we can talk about the preload and the afterload, but basically that's a generic um, assessment for this patient. And then now we're gonna talk about orders. How do you talk to the doctor? Say, hey, this is, a doc this is what's wrong with my patient. So let's go into that next. All right, next, so your patient is not doing well. Your blood pressure, you've repeated three, five times, different places over and over again. The blood pressure is going down. It's time to talk to the doctor. Um, you let them know about the three symptoms. So you first have to figure out who the attending is, and if the attending has any resonance, you might want to call them first, okay? Um, medical students are just, just there to observe, not so much intervene, so you'll want to focus your notification towards the resident, and if there's no resident, straight to the attending. Now the attending is higher up, and the resident's in the middle, and the medical student's down here, so you talk to the resident first. And you say, hey, hi, my name is Howie, I'm the nurse for this patient, blah, 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 patient who's in room 108 over ward something. Tell your step down or ICU. Here's the situation. The patient is congestive heart failure and he's been coming in for this, he's been treated for that. Lately though, when I came to assess the patient, he was having a very, very hard time staying awake, um, trying to talk to me, he's extremely fatigued. The blood pressure has been going down. I've rechecked it several times on several different limbs and I can't get a temperature. I've checked the limbs and I saw that the limbs are very, very cool and clammy, cool to the touch. Here's what I suggest. I think that the patient might be going to cardiogenic failure. I recommend if you would like to first try to see if the patient is able to handle a fluid bolus. And let's, let's talk about another fluid bolus. So a patient who has a difficult time with pushing blood into their body, for the first part, if they're hemodynamically, if they're going into hemodynamic shock, they're losing a lot of fluid. So you're trying to refill the body with fluid before you can get blood in and you start with normal saline or lactated ringers. But here we have a cardiogenic shock. There's enough blood in the body, but there's a pump problem. So if there's a pump problem, you wanna be able to see if maybe the patient is fluid responsive and if he can be okay with that. But there's a tricky thing aspect to that is that patients who are congestive heart failure are in fact fluid overloaded already. So you might wanna to try to bring down the fluid bag um, to maybe around 250 at most 500. But also you wanna talk about the, the rate with the resident. If you're just giving it at 100, um, 150, it's kind of slow. And if the patient can drink water, why not just have them do that? Um, but actually, a uh, fluid bolus is useful, but just 
you know, be mindful of the amount of fluid that you give and how fast you give it because this might make the congestive heart failure for your patient even worse, exacerbating the cardiogenic shock, okay? So once you get past that, let's say that the patient is crashing a little bit faster. You say, hey, we've already done the fluid bolus. We've covered that. What would you like to do? Would you like to take them to the ICU? Would you like to give them a presser? Things like that. When I was dealing with a patient recently that had cardiogenic heart failure, the patient was on a deltaism drip to try to keep their heart rate under control. So when the resident came to assess the patient, I don't know if he didn't really believe me, but he thought, well, maybe the patient just needs glucagon to be able to reverse the beta blockers that we were giving him because he was under a couple of beta blockers um, to try to calm down the heart and try to control the rhythm. But at this point, I knew that that probably wasn't the problem because for one, the heart rate was okay. It was at the 70s and 80s, so you knew that if it, if it was a heart rhythm problem, I saw that it was sinus rhythm, um, or at least AFib RVR controlled, and we'll talk about that later, but most importantly, that the rate was okay. It wasn't so fast that it was trying to compensate and it was beating fast, compensating for increasing perfusion in the body, but also making it hard for the heart to actually have a good pump. So I kept pressing the doctor, I was like, hey doctor, do you really think that that's gonna help? Because we've already given the fluid bolus, it's finished, um, and we ran it a little faster, you know, at exactly the rate that you wanted, and then you said you wanted to run it faster, so we did. Um, you really wanna push the doctor to see if they can run the rate a little fast, see, especially if a patient is crashing below a MAP below 60, that's bad, okay? So again, the mean arterial pressure is the MAP, that's basically the formula of where the systolic is, um, um, uh, I did two diastolic times two, all divided by three, okay? So that's a mean arterial pressure that we kind of go to as a quick um, barometer to see whether or not the patient's blood pressure is okay because, you know, the systolic can be high, but the diastolic is low, or the diastolic is high and the systolic is low. A map will kind of just kind of take everything into consideration, and then you can just use that as a single barometer to see whether or not the patient's blood pressure is working. Okay, so um, at this point, the doctor goes out and... Um, you know, starts to agree with me and he says, wait, let me go check the heart. And he gets a point of care ultrasound. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. But the ultrasound looks into the patient's heart and he can see, it's the same ultrasound that we use for looking at babies, but it's at a different frequency. But we can see that the ventricle was not making any good movement. It was just like, like this. So technically, if you could take a guess, the cardiology fellow who came in afterwards said that the um, it's actually a fraction which we had known the patient was at like 25% is more like six seven percent So it was not good. So they confirmed To me and to everybody else that the patient was in fact getting cardiogenic shock Okay, so that was a lot but just remember the three things look at the patient not the monitor first Look at the patient. Is the patient tired? Is the patient so fatigued? And then you know that that's part of the normal symptoms for a person with car um, congestive heart failure. Um, you might even see a little bit of a jugular vein distension from the heart backing up. Superior inferior vena cava. You know, as you can see, a plump uh, uh, IVC. But you know, just looking at the patient, it's just where they're just so tired, and then they're so like ashy and 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 dusky. And then look at the temperature. Can you even get a temperature? Do you think it's a machine? No, if it's not the machine, make sure it's not the machine, then it might be the patient. After all, it might be a real abnormal value. Try it again on the axilla, try it again in a different part of the mouth, didn't work, definitely you've got a positive sign. You know, be confident, just be like, cover your, your um, cover your, I mean, dot your T's, <laughs> sorry, dot your I's, cross your T's, make sure it's not the machine that's the problem, and it's not your technique, and then, after that, decide that, yes, it is my patient that's having these symptoms. Don't be insecure, you know? Know that you covered everything. And then three, check the blood pressures. The blood pressure is usually part of, you know, is, is seen in the monitor. So you look at the rhythm and make sure that the rhythm is okay. And then look at the blood pressure, look at everything, and then try to put these things together enough so you can make a report to the doctor and uh, good assessments, treatments, and intervention are. Okay, all right, so we're gonna do a little bit of a review and I hope this helps you out. And if it does, please comment, like, or subscribe, specifically subscribe. I'm trying to get more better at uploading every week. Uh, try to do it on Tuesday, but yeah, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, my name is Howie Nurse or Instagram, it's Nurse Howie, that's more where I lurk. Or you can just send me an email and check out my website 
nursehowie.com. Again, that's www.nursehowie.com or just nursehowie.com. Then you can check all my notes about how I made this video and about my experience and see if it helps you out. And if it does, please let me know, okay? All right, Ooh, Nurse Howie out. I hope you guys have a good shift. Take care of your patients, take care of each other, bye. Hey. hey guys, I forgot to mention that if a patient's blood pressure goes from really, really low, for example, going below 16 MAB, and then it goes lower and lower and lower, and then all of a sudden the blood pressure becomes super duper high, like in the triple digits of the solid diastolic and even the map, then it's something that's a certain phenomenon that I've noticed. Let's call it a Howie's phenomenon, or Realibit phenomenon. Oops. Or Howie's phenomenon, that's my alarm, because I'm on break in the car, and just realize that it's also another part of cardiogenic shock, because I think it's a systemic vascular resistance trying to compensate for the loss of perfusion by trying to vasoconstrict in order to preserve whatever's left of um, the blood that's in the body to try to keep it inside the core of the patient's body in order to be able to perfuse uh, the most resource-heavy part of the body, which is the brain, and then the heart. Okay, so once again, if the blood pressure is low, 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 maps below 60s, and it goes like that for a trend, and then all of a sudden it becomes triple digits, then it's just another part of cardiogenic shock. So that's when you really, really have to figure out that it is becoming more and even more and more important for you to be able to act on that, get a rapid response, or at least somebody who's an attentive uh, physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, whoever, to be able to get that escalated level of care for your patient. Uh, and if you're not already in the ICU, get them there. Okay? All right, so I'm going to go back to work, guys. Bye. Talk to you later. Cardiogenic assessment. Nurse Howie out.